Those of you who don't know me and have not met me yet, my name is Stephen Grandchamp. I have the privilege of working with this team and being the CEO here at Vaden. I've been here just about two and a half years, not quite two, a full two and a half years. I see somebody's alarm going off. Does that mean it's time for us? Whose alarm's going off? Is it time for us to start? You know, pull the door shut? All right. Thank you, Pete. All right. Everybody, well, welcome. Let's officially kick off and get rolling here with 2023 Baden Create. It's an honor to have so many of you here representing so many different sort of roles and stories and timelines in the history of the company. It's a pretty amazing thing to see a company that's been around in this space. For, for those of you who don't know, 2024 was the beginning of our 24th year. It's, I don't think I know a small software company that's been around 24 years. It's a pretty unusual feat, right, in this space. And so I've been in the software business a long time, maybe longer than I should kind of admit, but seeing the kind of enthusiasm, dedication, commitment that I've witnessed here, not just from employees at Vaden. I mean, it's pretty interesting to walk around the company and when I was first here and like meet some of the, oh God, I've been here 18 years. I've been here 20 years. I've been here 15 years. I've been here a dozen years. That is just, not all that common in the technology world. So we really have a tremendous team of Vodneers here to connect and work and create with you. You can recognize all of us by these fancy pink lanyards. So anybody wearing one of these, you know, feel free to flag us down. We're here to help and we'd love to get to meet and know you, those of us who don't know you. So when I was first recruited here into this position, I was told that there were three qualities that were important in to be a good fit here at Vaden. One was open source. Certainly that's a, obviously, I've been around open source since before it was called open source. I think my first open source company was 03, 04. So that I think made sense. Developers, I'm an old COBOL programmer. I think old being the operative word started way back in the punch card days, right? But then the third piece that was required, or not, maybe not required, was a knowledge of the Finnish culture. So those of you who don't know, the company's based in Finland, right? And so what does the Finnish culture mean? So one of the, one of the companies that I was at before here is a company called MariaDB, which is, for those of you who don't know, the MySQL uh, founders. It's a Finnish company. Sun acquired MySQL, Oracle acquired Sun. They forked the MySQL code and created MariaDB. And so I worked for MariaDB in 2013, 14, 15, 16. And my first experience with MariaDB was a company meeting in Budapest. And the company event was at the oldest bathhouse in Europe in, in Budapest. And so think of what kind of, what kind of happening is going on at the oldest bathhouse for the community event in Europe? And I'm an American coming into this company, right? And I'm thinking, wow, all right. Um, nudity isn't exactly something that Americans were that comfortable with. So when I got here with sauna here, sauna everywhere, bathhouse here, bathhouse everywhere. And I thought, oh, wow, this is a very different culture <laughs> than, than I was used to coming from. So for those of you that are new to the company or maybe new to the customers, the culture this is an amazing company, right? The connection between our customers and the employees and just the whole technology ecosystem in general is something that I am really proud to be a part of. And for those of you who don't know the company that well, there are three values that sort of drive the company uh, today. And the first, come on in. There are seats. Come on in. There might be scattered. There's, I know there's two right up here in the front and the third one up over here. I see a couple in the second row over here. So our, our first value for the company is, come on up, there's one right up here if you're not too afraid of the front row. <laughs> well, and I think I see another one right back in there. If you've got an empty seat next to you, would you raise your hand so that someone can find one? No, oh, thank you. Thanks, let's allow you to get settled. So. Our first value as a company is to choose the herd. At, at Vaden, those of you who don't know, Vaden is a Finnish word, it means female reindeer. And 
we have a very special herd. And to choose the herd means choosing what's best for the company and our customers and the product versus what might be best for you individually. And to watch people work together as a team in this company is really a, a lot of fun. And it's really an amazing, I think, honor to be part of the herd. The second is for us to own the solution. We're in the business of solving problems. And it's very easy to point out problems. I mean, I can do it and we can all point out problems. The hard part is what do we do about them? So our second value as a company in working with you as customers is to own the solution. What can we do to help you create a solution that works for you and works for a large part of our customer base? And the third value, which we're going to talk a lot about today, is to dare to explore, to do. Technology's changed, right? I mean, every day you get up and my goodness, what's new and what's different. And 24 years being in business is a great thing, but it, it also means we have to do things differently, right? Technology changes all the time. So we have to think of different ways to do different things to solve today's current problems. So choosing the herd, owning the solution, daring to explore, these, va these values should come to fruition today over the next two days as we work together in this event called Vod and Create. So I really look forward to building some new memories with everybody today, tomorrow, and let's celebrate some of the changes, all the fun, and some of the craziness maybe that we've had together, those of you who've been with us for a long time. So welcome, welcome. I'm really happy to have you here. When I look at the vision statement, it struck me that this has remained consistent throughout the company's history. We do have a couple of really special guests that I think are here with us today. One, I'm really happy to announce that our founder, Jonas Lutnan, is with us since the very beginning, is now back running product for the company. And our chairman of the board is here with us today, Juan Carlos. So would you raise your hand? He's also wearing one of those pink lanyards. So if you have an opportunity, it's really a special, I think, time that both of them are here to join us today. And Jonas is going to follow me and talk a little bit, a lot, actually, about sort of where we see the company going, the next stage. So while this mission started out pretty simple and powerful, it's changed a lot over the years, right? Remember the browser wars of early 2000s? I mean, those of you who are around, I see some of you are pretty young in this audience. Maybe you don't remember that. I do remember that, right? So just think back for just a minute. What was your technology world like in the year 2000, right? It's hard to believe, but were you amazed at the convenience of the USB flash drive? Remember those when they came out? My God, you could put that thing in your pocket and take it with you anywhere. Now think of that, 256 megabytes is all you could put on that thing. But man, that was a big difference from those floppy disks that they didn't hold up too well, right? How about, were you amazed at either of the new operating systems? It's hard to believe that it's been that long ago in 2001 shedding all kinds of old command line, which some of us really like to get back to that command line. But these, these early versions have, have really influenced Windows and OS2, or OS, OS2, OS X <laughs> today. It's, I'm dating myself there. <laughs> Remember the o Windows OS2 wars? I was there for those. How about, how about this? Who remembers the first one? Who, who has one of these? I have one. I still got it at home. It's in a box. I, I think it still works. I'm not 100% sure. But it seems so archaic now. But without the iPod, we probably wouldn't have the iPhone, right? It's hard to believe it was not that long ago. Thousand songs in your pocket. That was a, a pretty amazing thing to think about back then. And what would we do without Bluetooth? And how about the pace continuing through 03, 04, 05, and 06 with a couple of small companies maybe that some of us have, have heard of. But the following year from 06, I think really gave us one of the biggest inventions that's really still with us today, right? I mean, think about this. The original iPhone released in 07. Anybody remember how much it cost? $499 for a four gig Four gig storage in the phone. <laughs> yeah, five ninety nine for the big one, right? It had a two megapixel camera. And who knew that it would sort of just change the world? It wasn't so much having a phone, it was a computer in our pocket. So 
that's just a little bit, I think, of what's happened over the last 24 years. When it's, you think of where we were in computing 24 years ago, and you think of where we're going. So I'll close maybe with onto a few logistics, and I'm going to have Jonas come up and give us sort of a, a sneak peek into where we think things are going in terms of technology. So for logistics, those of you who came in, as you head out this door and to the right, the most important logistic, where are the bathrooms? Where are the toilets? Hang a right, go straight out, and they're on your left there. So that's, that should be easy enough to find. The, the routine over the next couple of days, I know you can't probably really read this, but I think you all got an email looking at the calendar for today. Most of that will take place in this room. There'll be some very, I think, interesting sessions. We'll go back to the latest news and product deliveries over the past year. There's some really good expert advice on modernization. And then today, at the end of the day, we'll close with a panel from some of you in the room up here talking us through. I know you'll be on that panel. It's good to see you in person. Um, and walking through their experiences, their challenges, and hopefully their successes with the product. So hopefully we can, you don't have to listen to us. We can learn from each other during the next couple of days, which would be very good. And then we close today with some fun, some cocktails and a pub quiz. Uh, Marcus, where are you hiding? You'll be sort of running that. So um, that's a good way, I think, to finish the day. Tomorrow, we break into two tracks. We have a developer track and a strategy track. Uh, we'll break into a, a few different rooms and we'll close the day sort of with some round tables on all kinds of uh, interesting topics. You'll have the ability to sort of pick and choose which topic makes sense for you. And there'll be an email coming out again tonight to take you through um, specifically how to do that and what time those start. Um, a couple of other things as you head out in the lobby, um, with a nod to the concept from Apple and the Genius Bar, you'll see a bunch of tables out there for our own herd of nerds. You can stop by and uh, get more detailed information from the product management team, our amazing DevRel team, the UX team for things like design, accessibility. So we'll be staffing those tables throughout the entire event. And so feel free to come by and, and mingle with that group. Um, there's really some great smart people out there. Then what would an event be without a little contest and a few prizes at the end? Um, we are handing out tickets to sort of get people encouraged to stop by those herd of nerd booths. Um, give us a little hit up on social media, participate in the pub quiz, stop by um, maybe in some user testing that's come on in. I think, okay, let's ask again. If you got an empty seat by you, raise your hand so this gentleman can find a spot. You can see a few empty spots. Come on in. Don't be shy. <laughs> All right, we'll draw winners at the end of the day, and you can see there'll be different sort of coupons or uh, amount of tickets for the, the particular activity that you're involved with, but don't be shy. It'll give you an opportunity to come around and meet as many different people as possible. Uh, and as I mentioned, tomorrow we have roundtable discussions, so take a look here, see if these topics, which ones of these introduce you. And we had these, we had a, um, an event in Brussels earlier this year, and we had roundtables like this and getting input from everybody and listening to sort of your peers talk about where they're at in all of these various areas as they interest you. It's a great way to learn from us and, and, and from us to hear from you what are the most important things uh, today for you and your organization. Uh, don't forget t-shirts. You see all those lovely shirts that the Bodden team are wearing. There are shirts for you here. They'll be available at lunch. Just stop by the registration table in the corridor where you, went th where you met this morning. And then there is an opportunity to book some one-on-one -on -one time with myself, with Jonas, with Leif on technology, with Ben on some of the modernization topics. So if you're in the midst of sort of maybe a thorny issue or not exactly sure how to approach a particular problem, please feel free to book a one-on-one -on -one time over the next couple of days um, with either one of us. And then certainly don't hesitate to stop by, have a cocktail, visit, and get some Vaden trivia um, and some snacks. And so with that, I would like to say welcome. Thank you for coming. I'm going to turn 
the podium over to Jonas. Come on up, join me in welcoming Jonas Lettner, our co-founder. All right. All right. Thank you, thank you. Is the mic working? Yeah, seems so, seems so. All right. All right, amazing to be over here and amazing to see so many of you coming over here as well. So I was having breakfast this morning and I sat down and the gentleman next to me was saying that, hey, I just flew in from Brazil to this event. And I was, oh my goodness. And then he said that, yeah, I'm here for hearing what's happening next at Vaadin. And I was, oh my goodness, I should have maybe prepared a bit better for this presentation. <laughs> so uh, quick show of hands, who is from Frankfurt? <laughs> All right. Who's from Germany? Quite a few. Who's from uh, uh, Europe? Uh, who's from outside of Europe? Yeah, quite a lot of people coming from outside of Europe, so. Thank you for flying in, so it's really <coughs> cool to have you all here. See, let's see if this is uh, worth it, and if it's not, then come and grab us from the, from the shirt and, and challenge us and tell us where we should be going rather than what we are thinking where we are going. All right. Uh, So, uh, where is Vaadin going? I think uh, for anybody when kind of thinking where you're going and what do you see next to you, you should start from where you're coming from first. And for that, uh, it actually starts a bit earlier than 24 years ago, as, as you said. It's uh, coming from 98. So, I, we were having a team uh, working at this startup called Atuline. Uh, I think Mark here is from there and I'm from there but we had like eight people building this healthcare website and this was I believe the first virtual hospital system in Europe meaning that you could have like a cross-border doctor-patient consultations so like high security requirements we had like payment systems in there first electronic prescription in Europe so we were kind of hacking this together real quick but the tech team we didn't know anything about healthcare so we were kind of scratching our heads that yeah it's cool that we are building this healthcare system but at the same time, it kind of feels wasteful for us to build all these parts for the, for the system. When we really are building these Lego blocks, we are building like uh, internalization Lego block, and we are building login, and we are building security infrastructure, and we are building this and that. They have nothing to do with healthcare. So we started thinking that, hmm, now it's almost, uh, at that point of time, it was kind of turning the year 2000, a dot-com boom, like really booming, and all the startups around us building all kinds of systems asking for help that uh, maybe we could help them a bit. So we thought, hmm, yeah, maybe it's a good idea to start a company around this. So let's build all kinds of Lego blocks for those reusable parts and help all the companies to build these systems. Boy, we were wrong. I mean, dot com boom, that kind of crashed real bad. So we are started a company and found that there is no customers around us at, at, at all. But I think the first intuition was right. So we were building these Lego blocks and then we started kind of looking at a bit more deeply. Uh, should we start from login screen or should we kind of go in depth? And then we started thinking the best thing that we knew was Delphi. You, anybody remembers Delphi for Pascal? So that was a really beautiful way of building component oriented uh, applications. But that was for Windows basically. And we didn't see any of that for web. So I think we kind of came up with the first component-based web framework at that point of time. And I kind of uh, did a bit of a history tour and dug up this picture from 2001. So this is the architecture of Vaadin 0.0.1. Anybody guess is what is UIA? It's a bit academic. It's, it's not exactly UI component, it's UI automata. We were coming from university, so we <laughs> a bit more kind of a uh, academic point of view. And we, then we added a persistence layer in there. So basically kind of invented our own uh, branch of Hibernate, like uh, I think 10, 50 years before Hibernate. It didn't work that well though, but it, it was there. And then we added like uh, theming in there. So we were calling them skins. I mean, Finnish theme with not that deep understanding of what are the good words to choose for the product. I mean, the product was called Millstone. It wasn't that kind of a lightweight sounding at when we kind of think that from the res retrospect, but yeah, that's what we built. And obviously this was running in a cluster, so we were having a way for running this. And 
when I was looking at this picture from 2001, I was kind of thinking, yeah, this is actually looking pretty similar to what Vardin is today. It's not that different. So in a way, it even kind of started having mobile UIs. I mean, this is the uh, first uh, WebKit-based browser from Nokia. We got a kind of preview of that and of obviously kind of fit this uh, UI working in there. It's completely unusable as you can see from there, but it, uh, it was a cool to be first in, in this one. And after a while we thought that, yeah, it's kind of a cool for us to build for this for ourselves. We kind of fell in love with the tool. So it, it's, we should get it out there somewhere and we have had no business understanding. So what to do about it? We loved Linux, we loved open source. So we just put it out. Um, so this was third full rewrite of Vardin that was called 0.0.3. So I was thinking that, mm, yeah, if you're kind of pushing out 0 0.0.3, .0 nobody's going to be using it. So let's kind of do a marketing trick and have like 3.0.0. .0. It's kind of almost the same numbers anyways. <laughs> and Windows 3 was so successful that we kind of cheated a bit. So this is became a third rewrite pushed out at December 2002 with the LGPL license and been open source since that. And actually the whole concept has been quite stable since that. So super happy how that turned out. So with that, uh, we kind of started understanding what we are building and what we are looking after is basically making it super easy for people to build uh, business web applications. So we first were thinking for ourselves, let's build it for ourselves, scratch our own itch, and then we push it out for everybody else and here you are. So it's uh, obviously there is uh, some need for that kind of uh, framework. So how did we do this? What was the kind of foundation of this? We basically anchor this into two different strong concepts that we wanted to build upon. First one is Java. So we saw Java ecosystem booming. It's not just like a stable platform, but it's also amazing thriving ecosystem. So basically building on top of Java, it allowed you guys to use everything out there for, for Java. And the second one was hiding complexity or fighting complexity or fighting for simplicity or kind of a trying to abstract away from all this pesky, how do I support all the IE5 versions and how do I uh, do the communication over the web and so forth. So we kind of encapsulated that with components and it's been kind of a stable, stable concept as well since that time. All right, that's the history part. What's happening right now if you look from outside in? So the first question I was kind of thinking myself is that yeah, we are building on this stable Java platform. Stable Java platform, is it really stable? I mean, it's a, we all rely on that, but it's sometimes a bit scary. This is from a Stack Overflow survey, and I think this is the best survey out there, 100,000 people answering this every year. So Java is uh, over there with the 30% and some of all the developers in the world using that. Um, but when you look at the top of it, there is uh, basically JavaScript slash TypeScript, that's the kind of number one, it's used for everything. Uh, but SQL, HTML, that's used for everything as well, and it kind of works with Vardil just fine. But Python has been growing quite well, and I, I think they're riding the AI wave, and, and kind of a riding the wave of it being, being easy language to learn when you go to school and, and start programming. And so it's kind of a... But it, Looking from this lens, I started kind of thinking that, yeah, how is Java actually doing in here? I recall it was maybe more than, than 30%. So I went through all the surveys that I could find from seven years, and it doesn't look good. Java is declining in these surveys. So that's kind of scary. Um, it's scary for us, it's scary for all of the, you in, in, in the room. And then I started digging a bit deeper, is this really true that Java is declining as a market share. And I guess it is true, but at the same time, it doesn't mean that Java number of Java developers would be declining. Actually, when looking at the numbers, the number of developers in the world is growing at the same pace. So basically they are canceling each other. We still have the same number of Java developers in the world as we had 10 years back. And uh, I kind of uh, started just doing the math. 30 th 30% times 28 million developers in the world means like 9 million developers. So I thought that this is a familiar number. I have heard this before. So I went back and looked what uh, Sun was advertising back in 
2012. So 11 years ago, they actually ran advertisement saying that, hey, 9 million Java developers in the world. So it's kind of strange, it match, matches exactly. So it, to me, it looks like the number of Java developers is exactly stable. What happens is that we are adding lots of Python developers and some like uh, website developers on top of that and the total number of developers growing. So actually, I'm kind of uh, feeling good about that <laughs> again. So Java, still stable platform and the ecosystem is still thriving. So what happens to the web at the same time? I've been hearing about this React thing quite a bit. I don't know who has heard of React thing, but it <laughs> seems to be a, a thing out there. Uh, so looking at the same survey, how many developers are using different web technologies? Uh, three that kind of uh, pop to me is React 12 million developers, Angular 6 million developers, and the most popular Java-oriented uh, web technology over here is Spring Boot, that's 4 million developers. All right. And these are actually overlapping, so it's not many people are answering that they're using both Angular and React uh, or Spring Boot. Uh, so kind of diving into this a bit more, what are the Spring Boot developers then doing? So I, I asked a question at LinkedIn, and uh, there is a LinkedIn group uh, for 300,000 Spring developers, so it's a really good presentation or representation of, of what's happening around Spring, and I got like 1,600 answers basically asking, how are you as a Java developer writing your web apps? And it was a bit surprising to me. I was expecting that quite a few of these people, they have a separate front-end team and a separate back-end team. But it's turned that's like 10% of, of all. But the rest, 90%, they are basically in two different groups. One group is writing everything on the server side Java. Unfortunately, that's not Vardin. So it's uh, Vardin is a subset of that. It's, it's not like a half of the Spring developers would be using Vardin. Uh, the other half, they are actually nowadays uh, multilingual in a way that they are writing both front-end uh, tech as well as the back-end tech. And that's kind of changing quite a bit. I, I think the situation was quite different uh, 10 years back. Actually, quick poll. So how many of you are using in your own team also some front-end tech in addition to Vardin? Not too many, actually. It's like a 10% of, of this group. So look like this group is in the, in the first category in, in there. So uh, from kind of uh, what people are using, kind of they're moving to architecture. So because the architecture has been always the foundation of Vardin, what, what makes Vardin quite special. So if you look at the uh, typical web application architecture, we have like a persistence layer and business logic on the server side, then we have some kind of network. And then on the client side, we have US logic and state. And then we have uh, user interface. What do you actually see on the, on the screen? So. The most common way of building this is having li different tech for different phase of the, each different box in, in the tech stack. So you choose REST or GraphQL, you design that in a way that it works both for the server side and the client side, then you use some front-end framework on top of that. You might also use some component library, but actually many don't. They just think that they can write everything by themselves. They are wrong, but they, they think so. And on the back-end side, you might be using any language, uh, even JavaScript over there. So this is aligning quite well with the service or in the architecture or microservices. So isn't that good? So what we have been doing at Vardin since 2002 is quite different. We basically try to cover as many of these layers as we can with one tech. So you can write everything in one language, you have control over everything from one place. Uh, the components are a bit separate because when you want to add more components, then you are uh, starting to at least use a different language. Uh, but what we added lately is called Hilla, Vardin Hilla. Where, oh, actually, let's go there. So it's just kind of a dumb example because everybody knows how this is working. So in Vardin Flow, you basically can write everything in Java, add components there, add event listeners in there, and so forth. So nothing new for this group. So when we added Vardin Hilla, the thought was, how could we actually get to serve these people who both write everything in Java, but also want to use some front-end tech? And this is kind of a puzzling thing, because those people, they either they have a separate front-end developer in the same team, or they are just multilingual in a way that they like to write in, in both of these. So we crafted Hilla to be 
what we think is a kind of a perfect bridge between Java and the front-end tech. Uh, we first uh, kind of embraced web component standard and used the tech called Lit. We still do, but uh, it was kind of uh, loudly communicated to us from outside in that uh, React is the, is the framework to support there first rather than uh, pushing people to use Lit that nobody has heard of. Um, so in this, uh, you write things in, in Java, you can basically cover uh, both the network and the server side in, in Java. You have the same set of components and then you can write the UI in React. So if you compare that code-wise, it's, it's flow looked like this. So like every, all of the code in one place, with Hilla, you have basically two different places. So on the server side, you write some kind of service, so in this case, customer service. Uh, you annotate that with service annotation. So with string, it basically just publishes the service. And what we add on top of that is uh, we make it callable from the browser, basically uh, making it really easy for to, to start calling that service directly from the browser by annotating it with browser callable. So on the, on the browser side, uh, what this does, it generates uh, all the data types on the client side. So basically in here, we have a list of customers. So it takes that uh, Java definition of list of customers, generates TypeScript descriptions for the same. It generates uh, code for accessing that from the, from the uh, browser to the server. And that way makes it as easy as, as you can for React. So for example, in this case, we just put in the state list of customers and then we fetch it from the server side using these APIs that Hilla generated for us. And in the end, we just kind of render that from the screen with the Vardin combo box component. But as you can see, this is a bit harder than, than flow. So what's the point? Uh, to me, it is kind of a clear division. So if you want to be as productive as you can, definitely go with, with the flow. So flow is still the most productive way of building web apps because we just abstract away from all those layers. But if for some reason you want to have more control over the client side, or if your team likes React, we are making it possible for you to use React without kind of all the extra hassle that it typically drags in. Uh, if you want to learn this, Marcus is having a presentation, I guess tomorrow. Tomorrow on, on how to get started with React and, and Java uh, for with Hilla. So that's a good presentation to, to look at. So get, getting back to the team structures, uh, people kind of notice with this architecture that you can organize your team by splitting that in two different parts. You can have like backend team and the frontend team separately, or you can have full stack team. And uh, there kind of have been eternal debate in organizations, which one is better? Should you be kind of uh, splitting these two different competencies, different teams or even like different countries have like, I don't know, React team somewhere in India and then backend team somewhere in, in US or something like that. And uh, I would kind of advise strongly against going with the two separate teams if you can. So it kind of comes back to, to team ownership. So when you have a team that you have empowered to solve a problem, own the solution, so to speak, then they are always more productive they can kind of uh, go and solve all of it by themselves. But if you split that team into two different parts, especially if they are kind of uh, geographically far apart from each other, if, if they have to kind of uh, work out of sync in a way that front-end team wants to do something, oh, the API, API is missing, let's kind of add a Jira ticket and wait for the other team in two weeks to come back to us. That kind of iteration really kills the ownership and kills the velocity. So if humanly possible, go with the full stack team. But if you go with the full stack team, uh, actually uh, another argument for the full stack team, I don't know how, how you like this guy, it's kind of controversial. DH8 is always, uh, he's writing really controversial stuff, but I think he has a good take on, on service oriented architecture and this microservices debate. So let me read it. Uh, as with many good ideas, service oriented architecture pattern turned toxic as soon as it was adopted outside its original content. Uh, original context and wrecked havoc once it got pushed into the internals of single application architectures. I, I guess this is what typically happens when you introduce a pattern and say that, hey, this is a best practice. 
Google uses this, Facebook uses this, and then people follow and they don't actually realize that uh, Google and Facebook have a bit different problem set that, that they might be having. Replacing metro calls with model separation with network uh, invocations and service partition in, within single coherent theme and application madness in almost all cases. Uh, so this guy created Ruby on Rails. Uh, I think he is right on, on this. He is <laughs> controversial on many other topics. But uh, yeah. So if you go back to this and, and look at the theme compositions, uh, it looks like uh, at least the spring audience gets it. Only 10% of that audience are really having two separate themes. The rest of them are having full stack. And the ones that are having full stack either want to do everything with the server or Java, or they want to use front-end tech and, and Java together in the same theme. And to me, it kind of uh, tells the story that whichever technologies you use, obviously you want to use Vardim, but whichever technologies you use, you should be choosing the technologies in a way that it really supports the theme structure. So if you are having two different themes, by all means go with the, the top solution where you have to kind of have these separate tech stacks and glue them together and negotiate with across the teams. But if you are having one full stack team, find a uh, tech that really supports that. So what we are doing at Vardin is try to uh, help Java developers, so we focus solely on Java developers, help Java developers to choose and allow them to choose between these two models. Either you want to use front-end tech, in this case React, or you want to use pure Java. And we believe that if you're using pure Java, it's the most productive way, but sometimes you choose to use React for the fine-grained control over DOM and uh, user experience, and it's, it's a great choice for that. But we want to be able to kind of uh, allow you guys to choose and your teams to choose, uh, even if you want to use that in same app. So you can, within the context of same app, use both. So that's kind of one part of, uh, that one kind of a work stream that we are, we are putting a lot of effort to make this easy for Java developers. So second thing is full stack components, and uh, so, all of you have seen all the Vardin components. We are super proud of the component set. It's, uh, uh, those, it, it's the kind of uh, those Lego blocks that you are using to build your applications. And we have been using a lot of effort to make these really work well. So we kind of think it as an ABC of uh, great user experience. You, all of them needs to be accessible. All of them needs to be beautiful. All of them needs to be consistent for your app to be able to be accessible, beautiful, and consistent. I mean, make no mistake, you can use Lego blocks to build something horrible as, as well. So it's not enough that those Lego blocks themselves are fulfilling this ABC criteria. Your app needs to do that as well. But oh my goodness, it's, it's hard to build uh, an accessible, beautiful, consistent application if your Lego blocks are not consistent. So at least that's kind of foundational thing that you have to have in there. We are having an interesting presentation from Yusu and Rolf later on on how you can theme your applications to make them look good. So maybe that's something to, to listen in if you are working on, on making your application look uh, a bit better than it's looking today. Uh, but back to full stack components. So if you look at these architectural layers, all our components this far, they have been on this final layer. They are just the UI components. They're kind of uh, atomic small blocks in there. And uh, we were kind of thinking, Back in the days of Atuline, the original vision wasn't that. The original vision was to have this larger set of compo components, login and uh, internalization and everything around the security. Uh, kind of a larger blocks that just can't be used, uh, can be built just on the user interface layer because they need database. So what we are doing right now is starting to build a bit larger components. We call them full stack components because they span across the whole stack. And uh, this allows you to actually adopt a ready-made piece to your application, something that is uh, typically built for separately for each application and teams are wasting a ton of, tons of time by building it by themselves while they would be, could be building application functionality instead. So we are fairly early on this journey. The first component was just released. 
Tarek will be showing that off uh, tomorrow. So if you are interested to see what we are doing on the user management side, so take a look of that. But uh, this is more than just one component. And, and the reason why we kind of uh, are excited about this is because we can. In a way, it's, it's different from everybody else. If you are having your framework solely on the client side, like Vue or Angular, you really can't do this. You have to kind of focus on the client side components. You really have to span across all the layers, have a control over the layers to be able to package uh, larger pieces of functionality in components. So at Vardy, we're going to think that, ah, oh, this is maybe a way to add value that nobody else can. I mean, we are wrong that nobody else can. Other people have been doing this as well. And uh, the other people here are the low code platforms like the Pegas and Mendixes of the world. But I know that no, none of you want to use any of those for many good reasons. But uh, the good side of that is that they have proven that this actually works. It really adds value when you have these larger blocks that you don't have to code yourself. You're gonna get it for free. Uh, so I'm optimistic that there is a lot of things that we can do in this space. And we actually started uh, doing this with real-time collaboration. It's not obvious that it's a full stack component because it's more of an infrastructure in, in Vardin. Uh, but it actually needs to be spanning across all the layers. I don't know if, how many of you have actually tried to do some uh, real-time collaboration in their applications? Quite few. So for the rest of you, there is a presentation for you. <laughs> Take a look at us, Leif and Sami will be speaking about this, how to do this. But I, I, I'm actually super excited about real-time collaboration as a theme. This is, Google really showed with the Google Docs that you can elevate the whole application by making teams to work better together. And then Figma took that even on the next level. And they won over the market because they embraced uh, real-time collaboration. So maybe you could do something in your space as well. Um, so this is the, our next theme. We are working on full stack components and the whole idea here is that let's have these prefabricated pre pieces that you can build your house out of so that instead of you kind of uh, building up everything out of small blocks. And I hear you asking, what are these blocks? And uh, I made a slide for that or actually I, I cheated. I, last night I asked Dali to make a slide. So we have a list of ideas that we want to build. And I thought that if I just kind of list ideas over here, all of you start waiting that oh, these guys are having this particle feature shortly. So, uh, and then you start pestering us that, hey, you promised this already last month, where is that? So I kind of fed all our kind of uh, ideas to Dolly and it's nice for obfuscating things. It kind of, you see a bit of themes that we are doing in here, but at the same time you don't. And the key, Part of this is the question mark. I want to hear from all you guys what you would need. What is the priority? What is the most important thing for you? So come talk to us, anybody with uh, this kind of ribbon and, and tell your wishes. We probably cannot do everything at, at first, but uh, I mean, if you start hearing the same thing multiple times, that's a good candidate for being top of the priority list. And we have a, a also round table tomorrow around, it's called low code, but it's really all about this. So join in there if you have strong opinions and you want to get commitments from our product managers that this is the, the thing that we should be building next. All right. Um, finally, how are we editing user interface? Uh, how are we doing with the time, by the way? Tarek, you had? Excellent. All right, so uh, how do we edit the UI? We had this product called Vardin Designer long time ago. We still have it. It's maybe not working the best at the moment, and there is a good reason for it. So uh, you all have been using uh, design tools, and they fall into two different categories. Either the design tool is looking like this, and it generates you code, and that code is like generated once, and then it's horrible to try to kind of maintain after that. And the second category is that they look exactly like this again, and it generates a model that you have to somehow integrate to your application. And that model typically is not flexible enough for you. You kind of uh, find all the cases where actually this was a wasted effort because you have to have more functionality than that the model can actually manage. 
So we took this later ladder part, and the model in here is uh, um, basically we serialize as uh, component tree in HTML using web components. But uh, it wasn't perfect. I mean, you can drag and drop things around, you can build a layout in there, you can edit the properties, and you get this kind of built fairly quick. And then you integrate that to your application, and even that is kind of okay-ish, but then you bump to problems when you need more flexibility around that. But we are not unique in, in this. Everybody having the same problem. I, I think the most visionary company, company, company in this space have been Next Step, and later on Apple that acquired them. They had this Next Step uh, UI builder that is a wonderful tool for designing around the, their model and kind of uh, building the UI on top of that. It kind of looks the same in a way. You have properties and record of things, things around. So if all of these tools, they look the same and they look fairly complicated as well. And uh, I think it was three years ago, Apple, out of nowhere, they came up with this. So what they did, they basically abandoned the whole model where you have a uh, design tool that creates a, a declarative model that you, then you somehow bind into your application. Instead, they kind of started from scratch. They introduced uh, what they call Swift UI, where it's kind of coding first way of uh, designing UIs. You, you code and you see the changes right away on the screen. We got excited. Hey, finally somebody gets it. It's a brilliant idea. Kind of let's get back to basics. Coders are designing the UI. So we followed them and we did the same. We can just code today on Vardy, whether that's Hilla or Flow, and you see the changes immediately happening on the screen. And I mean, nothing that spectacular in, in this. But it kind of feels that it's the right model, even though it's like a really bare bones at the moment. So one thing that it doesn't serve at all is how you get started with the application. What type of things are in there in the framework that you could use? What are the components in there? So what we did, we built uh, uh, StartWardenCom. How many of you have actually used StartWardenCom? Half of you. Um, who have taken a look of that this week or last week? Just a couple of you. So there are kind of new things happening in there. So it was first like a, a way for you to start uh, building your application by adding views in there. Let's say we want to add a map view in there and we can quickly build up a skeleton of our application, even look how it looks from, let's say, on iPad or iPhone. Or we could even take a look at the source code, how it looks like, so now it generates flow code in here. So you, at least you have a kind of idea how you could use those components. Uh, you see what type of components are in there. So let's do something else, let's do a dashboard. All right, this kind of code, it looks like that. So you can kind of craft your application real quick. But the problem is that this is not the real application. It, I mean, it's just a starting point. It's really cool for, for getting started because the problem is that it doesn't look like your application. So we went a bit further. I don't know how many of you have seen this one. So we can now add also views that you can edit. So if you go to edit mode, you can start dragging and dropping things around in here. Uh, so in a way, a bit of this old or traditional design tooling, you can choose new components, let's say what we have over here. Multiline text field, let's add it over there. And that way we can even choose it and let's kind of resize it and so forth. So kind of a, it starts to be a bit more useful, but still is th this is still in the beginning of your application development for maybe writing a quick prototype and thinking whether Vardin would be for you. But it doesn't help you at all during, during coding. Actually, one cool thing that we added in there is, I don't know if you have tried this one out, there is a share button. So you can actually have a link to this design that we just created. So let's see, let's take a copy of that. So if I open it up on a different web browser, we should be able to kind of go and use our new application that we just built. So in a way, it's, it's kind of cool showing off to your organization that, hey, you, we can craft something like this. Um, all right, what this misses completely is uh, how you use this during the development. Uh, where 
profile. So what we are doing next is uh, basically integrating all these tools uh, as well as theme editing tools to your code editing workflow. So we'll keep the code first workflow. You can edit the code as you wish. That's the master. That's the robust way of describing your UI. But we'll bring in these tools side by side so you can drag and drop uh, layout. You can edit theme. Actually, I think Leif will give a demo of that theme editor in a, in a moment. So that's kind of a, almost the final piece. The final piece that we have been working on is a bit strange. Uh, let me show you demo first and then describe what's happening in here. So as you have noticed, there is a lot of things happening around AI. So we asked ourselves, how could AI help Vardin? Uh, could it help you edit code? So this is again code first, but we brought in, this is a prototype. So brought in a way for you to start asking things from the LLM, like add a say goodbye button next to hello. All right, this added that button, but made a mistake. So make the goodbye button call say hello on the servlet server instead of say goodbye. So it kind of fixes the mistake. Uh, this actually works. So in a way, uh, what we are looking for is uh, adding a uh, modern expert sitting next to you and uh, making it possible for you to start asking them to do stuff. Uh, Tarek, do we still have time for me to give a live demo of that? All right. So uh, let's see. If this is super fragile, so probably you are going to be not going to be seeing uh, anything good from here, but let's ask something. Uh, I'm giving a demo at Vardin. Create. Uh, please add a quick quiz about, or maybe let's raise the bar quick, interactive quiz about Vardin. And because we have to ask nicely, we have to press the please button. <laughs> <coughs> so I don't know who you, who, who, who you know, Jouni Koivuvita from our team. Just a couple of you guys. So he's the guy who have designed all our component sets. So always when you are thinking that uh, only if I could have one guy next to me helping me, me to make this application beautiful, always kind of Jouni comes to mind first. So, uh, we started prototyping, and obviously the name we gave was Yoni. Uh, it's, it's written by, uh, without A, but we added A over there. So it's a, a robotized Yoni. So we, the vision over there is that, that we could have Yoni sitting next to you whenever you're coding, uh, writing uh, a new UI, and Yoni would help you. So in this case, what happens behind the scenes is that we run uh, first the, the query on LLM, asking it to kind of... Uh, uh, create a strategy, how could you only help building this thing? So Yoni kind of scratch his head and then uh, kind of uh, had a steps like let's first create the new view for the quiz, then define the questions and after that create a form and then Yoni started working through this. Behind the scenes we are using Pinecone uh, a vector database as a memory for Yoni so he's kind of building tasks in, in there and then he is editing the code base based on those tasks. Uh, the problem here is that Yoni is a bit slow at the moment. So we <laughs> <laughs> this is still a prototype and we are using now uh, GPT-4 behind the scenes. So we probably have to go with uh, Meta's code uh, Llama 2 model and then do a kind of a fine tuned training for it instead of a, we now have like huge prompts that we are using in, in there. Um, so what we are trying to do with this next is Make it possible for you to uh, ask Unity to integrate with your data model, ask you th them to take a look of your database, generate the data models, generate mock data for you, generate tests for you, integrate layout, integrate that, uh, layout templates for you. So all kinds of uh, kind of mechanical tasks that you know how to use or how to know how to do already, but it would be cool that somebody else would do that for you. So at the moment working on getting this to work, but kind of afraid that I'm running out of time getting Yoni to complete his task. How far are we? Still on the step two. 
Uh, I'll, I'll come back to here if we have time in the end and, and we'll see what Yoni created for us. Uh, so the second thing that we are doing with AI is uh, this is more, we have been, a lot of people come to Vaadin because they want to modernize their applications. So we were thinking, could we translate code to code or could we actually, I'll run it again, sorry. Or actually show a different demo. So could you actually take a screenshot of your application, feed those AI, AI then uh, recognizing what are the components in there, using OCR for decoding what are the labels in the components. And it actually does that today. It kind of a, has a rough picture of the, of the layout based just on pixels, and it generates a, a model that describes the UI. And from the model, we can generate code as well. I think still the code to code translation is, is better because then we can also translate the logic, but this kind of allows you to translate uh, UIs that you might not even have the code at the moment. So it makes it be kind of a faster to, to write uh, that mechanical part of the code. So that's kind of final piece of the, what we are working on at the moment. Basically trying to build the AI powered Varden expert and can kind of uh, work all this mechanical task for you. So with that, uh, actually before that, so we, the, the cool, cool side of, of kind of uh, prototyping all of this is that we learned quite a bit about AI, how it could be used. So we have two presentations that might be helpful for you. We share what we learned. So first Mark later today is speaking about how you could build AI powered business applications and Marcus tomorrow how you could build uh, AI expertise systems using vector databases. So those might be cool presentation for, for the ones who are interested in AI. So to recap, we are working on diff four different things. First, bringing Flow and Hilla together in a way that you can choose and have optionality on when you want to use front-end deck, when you want to use the back-end deck. Secondly, embracing full stack, bringing larger blocks of functionality to Vaadin uh, embracing the code first UI editing, bringing in actual layout editors and theme editors to, to code editing. And finally, uh, working with uh, various AI tools and making, they're ultimately making an AI powered Vaadin expert that helps you side by side with you. But I think the most important thing is that we still have the same mission, making it easy to develop business, up, uh, business web applications still based on the same stable platform and still committed on, on hiding the complexity with components. So uh, we are still on the same mission, but working on four different areas where you want to add more value for you guys. All right, that's everything I wanted to say. Uh, Tarek is looking happy because we didn't run out of time. <coughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, that's awesome, then we can, First show the results that you only built and then have time for questions. So, oh. <laughs> all right, thank you, Yoni. <laughs> that was real quick. So there is, uh, yeah. I don't wanna kind of, uh, see exactly where Yoni failed. Uh, when I asked the same question last night, he actually built us a, a working interactive quiz but with AI, you never know. It's a bit randomized process. So that's one of the problems. So one being a bit slow and, and one being a bit randomized. All right, with that, any questions? Anybody who wants to start? Everybody's stunned. These guys are working, building completely wrong stuff for us. Now it's a good time to make demands that, hey, I want to have that on roadmap, all right? There. Yeah, so we have a um, like product which we developed with Vaadin for a long time, and I wonder, I mean, Vaadin Start is great for mm -hmm. starting new applications, but I wonder how that would be possible to use it for our existing application, like, for example, building like one form with your form editor and implementing this into our existing application. Do you plan anything like this? Yeah, this is exactly the point. We, we try to bring in, uh, with the code first, we basically run your code, it shows on the screen. From what we have on the screen, basically on the DOM, we are able to uh, allow to 
to edit the layout, for example, or uh, uh, the properties. What we do behind the scenes is we uh, parse the code as well. So we recognize where in the code we have created all those components. Should we add more Java setters in there or should we have no properties on, on the React side and are able to configure the components? We are able to move them around a bit. So it's still not yet robust, but I believe that it will be making that possible finally. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah, one of the key components for us is because React was one of the main reasons we took the cloud in like 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, just wondering what the vision is for the bridge component moving forward to compression. That's a really good question. I don't have an answer for you. I, it, we recognize that that's the kind of foundation of Vaadin because it, it's so data oriented that everybody wants to have data grids in there. And today we have you know like two different flavors of grid. We have grid pro and, and the normal grid. Um, I'm still trying to kind of grasp how could we bring all the features in the same place or could we, uh, but uh, please tell us, so what are the kind of missing features it would be? I mean, it's, it's the most important component in the, in the whole framework. So what are the missing pieces you want to add in, in there? Um, I guess more control over editability, making it easier for components that are editable, um, making that more performant, I guess, as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Give us a bit more room, but yeah, control over um, particular cells, whether they're enabled, read only, very fine grained control over the cells and that kind of thing. Yeah. Makes sense. Hey, Rolf, you are here somewhere. Could you have a chat later on uh, and you could dive into details together so that we are able to. Rolf is, is running the, the team that is developing all the components. Yeah, so the question was uh, around what are we doing with the uh, grid component because that's uh, arguably the most important component in the whole Vardin. The Vardin really make it mostly being used in the data-oriented applications and the core foundation of that is, is to have a well-performing, flexible data grid where you can basically add any type of components in, in there. Uh, I don't think that we or I have answers for how to dive into details on, on actually solving those uh, kind of a, what are the added features or what are the kind of performance gaps in, in there. But anybody who has any wishes for the components, what to add in there, what are the gaps in the current components, that guy over there is, is, the, is the right one to, to ch chat with. Any other questions? Yes. Unfortunately, it's not on-prem. So uh, it's not just us, but we also consume, uh, in this case, uh, GPT-4 uh, GPT from OpenAI. So uh, the LLMs are running in cloud. So that might be limiting for, for some companies who just cannot share any of their code in, in cloud. We are today working on, on making the, the terms of service such that we are able to give guarantees that none of your code ever ends up in our training sets or anything like that. So that's, uh, we recognize that nobody wants to have their code in, in any training set. But even with that, uh, for AI, you basically have to transfer the code to, to a really big server that runs the uh, language model. Yes. Um, you talked before about your commitment to open source. Mm -hmm. And right now, there are some new stuff that you are trying out. Paid uh, components or not, like the, the visual uh, UI editor, mm -hmm. or more recently the um, push notification. Uh, so that, that makes it a bit uh, um, confusing. Or, um, for, for example, for the push notification, I since I'm mostly using the open source yep. stuff, uh, I don't know if I can try it out because can then become a paid thing that some of my clients may not be wanting to pay. I, I read your question. So okay. I'll just repeat the question for the audience. So what is the way, how do we look at uh, where, where we have a price tag where we don't have it, and especially with the new stuff, uh, when it's still out in, in a beta form, 
uh, will it be paid or not? It's a really qu good question. I don't have anything to announce today. Uh, I just jumped back a uh, couple of weeks ago to Vardin and one of the first things that I was looking was that we need to kind of uh, make it clearer on what is commercial and what is not. Our route is open source. We want to kind of really honor that route. So I, I can promise that we may do better in, in, in future in, in communicating what is free and what is not. But right now, I don't want to make any kind of announcement on, on pricing because we need to kind of think those a bit more through. Specific to the web push notifications that you maybe mentioned that you're adding in, in 24.2, those, those are on the open source side, definitely. So yep. they are really part of the core flow framework. So they, they will definitely be open source. All right, anything else? With that, let's have a break, grab some coffee, and please ask us more questions and, and tell us where we should be going. You know the themes that we are kind of working on, and with that, uh, I hope that you are able to kind of uh, push us to right direction in there. Thank you all.